Hi everyone. Um, welcome to this people and business session on neurodiversity asset or problem. Um, we have got a few more people who are going to be joining us along the way, so obviously just bear with that. Um, in terms of just general housekeeping, um, if you could keep yourself muted unless you're actually asking a question. Great if you want your camera on. We do love to have cameras on, but equally, if you're not in a position to have that, that's fine. Um, so the format today is going to be that we'll have a sort of panel discussion. And I think because there are quite a few of you in the room, we'll um, just keep questions to the end, if that's OK. I'll make sure there is time for you to add your contributions and ask any questions that you want to. So if I could just start by asking my lovely panellists to introduce themselves. Um, Sarah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, um, I am a coach. I specialise in neurodiversity coaching as well as doing kind of general sort of more coaching. Um, I'm an associate coach for an organisation called Genius Within. Um, I have a specialism in autism and ADHD, but I'm an ex-teacher as well, so I have an understanding of other neurodiversity conditions, um, including specific <laughs> learning difficulties. And I'm a mum of autistic boys, three of them. Thanks, Sarah. Dan? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dan Biddle. I am the Chief Executive of an organisation called the National Diversity Employment and Advisory Service. So we're a, a bespoke recruitment company and consultancy that uh, look to support disabled people, those with neurodiversity, those with learning difficulties um, into employment. But we also work with employers to make their recruitment processes and practices more um, equitable to those with, with various disabilities. Um, and also kind of to try and push the agenda of, of supporting disabled people into work and what supports are out there to make this a more inclusive process for people. Thanks, Dan. James. Hi, my name is James Lover. I'm from Aspident CIC. We're based up in Leeds. Um, we're a not-for-profit business which helps people, mainly with autism, access the workplace. Um, in order to fund that, we work with businesses to help educate them. Um, the main thing we do is our workplace profiles, which we use a um, sort of unique framework created by a lady called Dr Elizabeth Guest, which focuses more on the cognitive factors behind the autism rather than the, the symptoms themselves. Uh, and thus far, it's had a very good success rate. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Ileana. Um, hi, my name's Ileana. I'm head of operations for a cybersecurity co-working space um, as kind of my full-time job. However, I also run two nonprofits, uh, the first being a tech conference um, in cybersecurity and the second being the Women in Tech and Cyber Hub, so which? Um, and I am actually neurodivergent, so not only do I uh, manage a team that has people who are neurodivergent on it, uh, I am, uh, I've been diagnosed with ADHD for three years. I am pretty much the poster child for the late female diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. So just briefly, I'm, I'm Kay Hamblin from a um, company called 8 Legal. Um, so I don't have a specialism in this field, but we provide HR and employment law support to small businesses um, and also workplace mediation for helping to resolve conflict in the workplace. Um, so I'm just the chair rather than an expert today. Um, so just to get the ball rolling, I think um, lots of people talk about neurodiversity. I, I don't think... <laughs> Everyone always really understands the same thing by it. Um, so I just really want to start by saying just what does it mean to you? What what do you mean when we talk about neurodiversity? I'm going to start at the other end of my panel now, then so you can go first, Diviana. Um, neurodiversity, it's obviously really personal to me, but it also, because I have such a personal experience, can be a really narrow definition when I'm talking about it. And that's something that I work with. But I think in general, just when I talk about neurodiversity, it is simply a group of people whose brains are fundamentally wired differently. Not better, not worse, just fundamentally, our brains function and are different than um, everybody else, which it was, isn't the truth, because if you look at statistics, there's actually quite a few of us. Um, and it can, um, the one thing that I think with neurodiversity is that it has such a scale. You can have people who are dyslexic, but only switch a little bit of the words to people who can hardly read. And obviously when you're talking about sliding scales, and, and, and I would say that is true for any of the neurodivergence is that there's always going to be this scale of people who 
without second guessing you or without them being very open and honest you'd be able to be like that person has mm-hmm. think I, i'm a pretty general view of in, unless you know me for longer than a couple of weeks it's probably not going to be very obvious to there are people who can't sit still for longer than five seconds and you're like oh yeah i can see it on the adhd so i th- i think it's just our why wi- uh, our brains are wired differently but they're also wired differently on a scale. So my experience as someone with ADHD is not going to be the same as someone else's. Yeah, it's a really important thing to remember, I think, isn't it? James, did you have anything to add to that? It's an interesting one. If you start with, so the neurodiversity word was created by an Australian sociologist called Judy Singer. And by neurodiversity, she was referring to all of humanity. And the general goal of what the word was trying to do was move away from um the deficit medical model of disability um and create something um that appreciated everybody's difference and essentially remove a stigma so you could create a social movement around different minds and different brains it's kind of evolved a lot since then and it's almost moved back to a more vague version of the deficit model where where we sort of we we saw talking about autism and things like that and in many ways it causes a lot of confusion because like um, Ileana says, two people with ADHD can be very different and certain strategies you might use for those two people be counterproductive for one, but very beneficial to the other. And with autism, it's the same. You can get one autistic person where certain things will work extremely well for them. And then you try and then apply that to another person with the same diagnosis and it could be completely disastrous. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's quite complex, the whole thing um but really to me it's about just that whole diversity of different minds and one thing i'm quite passionate about is that i don't personally think there's a neurotypical or normal i think we're all different we all struggle it's just some people find things better for some of us i'd almost say for someone with autism you know the difficulty around social fitting in and connection is a chronic Whereas for other people, that not fitting, not fitting in, and that difficulty in that uh, social connection and communication is acute. Um, but essentially, I think you know we're all different. We all struggle, and it's it's a, a problem comes from us attempting to fit into a particular box in different contexts, which doesn't always work. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. How about you, Dan? I, I think for me, the, the the big thing is intersectionality. Is that you can have somebody who's autistic, but would also have traits of ADHD and and the crossover and the overlapping of some of the, the neurodivergence that, that people have. And I think the, the big thing for me, just kind of reiterating the point that, that James made, I'm 44 years old and I don't think I've come across anybody that's normal. So this whole definition of a normal person is very much... Um, what we perceive it to be is what what we view as what is normal so that there can't be a a definition of of what normal is I think for me the way that, that I with the work that I do in individuals that I work with every single person that I've worked with and supported has been unique in their own way they bring their own sets of skills and their own sets of talents to it and I think it's, it's really about getting people to understand that if you meet one autistic person you've met one autistic person if you meet one person with ADHD, you've met one person with ADHD. And there will be crossovers where people have autism and they have traits of, of ADHD or dyspraxia, whatever it may be. But I really do think it's about starting to understand that as a community, it's such a, a vast, unique community of individuals. And I think what we tend to do is lose sight of the fact that we're talking about individuals. When, as Ileana was saying, it's on a scale. We talk about autism and people always look at the real what's perceived to be the real negativities around autism and they don't really focus on what that person brings to an organization and what the the kind of skill sets that they develop and the coping mechanisms that they develop that could be really beneficial to businesses as, as they move forward so i think for me it is that individuality of it and the the intersectionality of the whole neurodivergent community to be honest yeah I think that's really interesting. What about you, Sarah? Well, I'd kind of agree with everything that Dan just said, to be honest. I, well, I'm, I have, from a personal point of view, I have three boys on the autistic spectrum. They are all completely different. So exactly what both James and Dan said is what strategies work with my eldest son do not work at all with my middle son or my younger son and vice versa. Yes, there will be some similarities, 
Um, but a lot of these conditions can coexist. And I think that's what people, I had an interesting conversation with somebody yesterday who's going down the diagnosis route around she's being judged for wanting to be labelled. And I don't think people who are neurodivergent want to be labelled. They want to understand. Mm. And when you have multiple conditions that are identified, so you've got a client with ADHD, dyspraxia and dyslexia, Yes, they have all, all have their specific traits, but actually they kind of create an internal kind of conflict. Sometimes they kind of battle against each other. So it's accepting the individual. So neurodivergent, yes, is an umbrella term, but I think you can't just blanket your approach to, oh, I've got a neurodivergent policy. You still have to take it as an individual basis. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the key take homes probably, isn't it? Is that it's a wide range of conditions in inverted commas a wide range of differences and the fact that they coexist and, and interact with each other is 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 something that perhaps people overlook a lot of the time so what what sort of difficulties do again we're going we're going to have to talk to some extent in generalizations obviously but what sort of difficulties do neurodivergent people face when trying to find a job and then in the workplace it's, itself and also kind of flipping that from the other perspective slightly what do employers and co-workers tend to struggle with, do you find? Um, I'm going to start in the middle this time. So how about you go first, James? I think it largely depends on the individual. Um, but there's certain aspects of, say, autism. If you take like the diagnostic criteria for, for autism, like part A is, is difficulty with communication and social interaction. So clearly that's that's potentially going to be a strong issue for, for someone with autism um and then when you get into that then you've got the part b sides and they're not you're only two out of four of these which is um repetitive speech and movements issues dealing with change um sensory issues i think that's a strong one sensory issues don't just affect people with autism or adhd everyone has sensory issues if we did a survey of everyone in this room anonymized it and then try to identify the people with autism and the people without we wouldn't be able to do it um so so that's that's another variety and then i might need some help here the third one fourth one's just disappeared out of my brain this is a change so oh strong interests so it can affect different people in in different ways so and actually if we just take those four aspects of part b there's 24 different combinations and then we can add severity into that and then you've got almost potentially a, an infinite number and then behind all those things there's a whole host of other cognitive factors which contribute to why those those four symptoms exist so really it it, it, it depends but yeah if we're looking at common ones i think um people tend to experience um issues around interaction mainly with co-workers um i think that's a really common one um where they've been accused of being rude or saying something inappropriate um i think that's something i've experienced so i've currently going for an adhd diagnosis myself um and when i look back at my career that got me into trouble a lot um so um so that's that's one big thing but again you can't can't really make any generalizations but I think ultimately if you're coming down to the problem is that we're constantly trying to put people into this this standard way of working the standard normality and it just doesn't exist and it really doesn't exist for someone who's whose way of experiencing the world and that perception of the the environment around them is completely different to that of their manager and most of their colleagues so you know, if I was to say like one thing that when we train people, we'd want them to not do any more, and that would be don't make assumptions. And I think, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of assumptions based on the workplace and through employment. And, you know, when we started to look at difference in the way people think, then, you know, you can't make those assumptions. Those assumptions become more harmful. Yeah. And I, they're, they're, they're nearly always going to be a generalisation, aren't they, as well? Which Well, that's it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not dealing with people as an individual, just thinking this isn't a person, this is an autistic person, or this is a person <laughs> with yeah. ADHD, and, and, yeah, making those assumptions. Yeah, I think another problem is that often reasonable adjustments can be put in place, but they're not necessarily well thought through. Um, we had one example when we were talking to someone from the NHS, you know, we did a talk to the NHS in Manchester, 
their personnel team and someone said oh, I've got dyslexia I used to work in retail and I found the most supportive environments were the most um, disabling to me so she was given tasks she just could not do um, but uh, she was given more time she's given extension she's going all I was getting was a greater opportunity to fail I um, felt worse about myself I felt started to build a bigger picture of what my colleagues must think of me it was only when a manager came along and said look this is clearly something that you you don't enjoy doing you're not you're not able to do but you're really good at this so why don't we you focus on this because it just so happens Susan over here is really good at that and enjoys it and she's willing to do more of that work so you can focus on this area he said that's where I suddenly became happy in my work and I did that and it's actually realizing that the person's not just telling you they can't you know they struggle to do it it's really that they're actually there's a disability in place which means they're really not capable of doing it and if you yeah. don't really think of the reason why this is happening you're going to make things worse yeah. so I think I think thoughtfulness as well but I'm taking I could talk forever so that's not <laughs> over to you Dan have you got some thoughts on this yeah, I think from from the perspective of of, uh, of a neurodiverse individual, I think what what we what one of the biggest barriers is, particularly from a recruitment perspective, mm -hmm. is we we lack the ability to be person centred in what we do. So when an organisation puts a, a role out, it's very generic in terms of the tasks and things like that. So we don't actually break down um, what that role would involve and where those barriers may be for somebody that, that's neurodivergent. So, and I'm, I'm disabled myself. I'm, I'm a wheelchair user. And I think a lot of the times when, when I've applied for jobs in the past before I had my own company, the focus was on my wheelchair. The focus was on my, my, my disability rather than what me as a person would bring to the organization. And I think there's been so much stigmatization around neurodiversity that organizations have lost sight of actually, this is a, a huge group of individuals across the, the country that bring with them a multitude of experiences and skill sets and problem solving abilities that those of us that aren't neurodivergent would never ever be able to work out ways of doing things the way that neurodivergent individuals do so there's a lot of strengths to what neurodivergency brings to um people and organizations the trouble is we're so focused on what the negatives are so when i'm running neurodiversity training i often ask people to kind of give me what they think neurodiversity is and it's always the negatives it's always the can't sit still, trouble with communication, all of all these things that are perceived to be the negatives around it. Nobody ever turns around and says, well, attention to detail, hyper focused, the ability of like real good problem solving skills. And I think that until we can start changing recruitment processes to be person centered, to actually work with what's going to work best for the individual to maximize that opportunity, to maximize productivity we're still kind of really got some challenging issues to face. And I think from an employer perspective, there is the stigma that goes with neurodiversity is the way that it's portrayed, the way that people think of neurodiversity. What we don't put forward is really good neurodiverse role models for organizations. If you're going back in time, Alan Turing, who cracked the Enigma code was autistic. If you look at Steve Jobs had autism, Daryl Hannah, the Hollywood actress was, is autistic. Charles Darwin, would have been on the autistic spectrum as was so there's all these amazing individuals that have gone on to achieve absolutely amazing things and, and revolutionize the world we live in yet we don't have these people put forward of actually this is the range of neurodiversity these are what individuals with neurodiverse conditions are perfectly capable of achieving the focus is always on the negativity around it which is almost like a shackle that we're giving to people because of it fits a label Whereas it, my disability, I'm a bilateral double amputee. People judge me on my amputations, but they never really understand what it is that I do and how I do it because they see me in a chair with no legs and go, oh, that's it, you're done. So it is these assumptions, it's these misconceptions that we, we hold about things because we don't understand it. And I think by having more person-centered approaches, we can generate that understanding. Because one of my bugbears is I have to kind of almost explain what i'm capable of when i meet people because i'm an amputee in a wheelchair so it is about overcoming what we we, we see as a diagnosis and focusing on the individual mm. because you'll get much better results when it becomes person-centered about the person and not the diagnosis and, and as much as we talk about medical and social models for the best will in the world we are still heavily shackled to the medical model because organizations straight away 
will go, well, that person's autistic. It's going to be, they may be uncomfortable in, in the office surrounding. They may be overstimulated by noise or bright lights. And yes, that will affect some individuals, but it won't affect others. And it is that whole, if you meet one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. If you've put reasonable adjustments in place for one person, don't think you can just carry that over and that's going to work well for the next person. You have to start the process again and generate that understanding of what that person needs to thrive in that environment. And I think that's where we fall down. Businesses just kind of look at it and go, oh, it's too time consuming. But it's not if you ask the right questions in the right way, you will get the results because people want to work. People want to be successful. Whether you're neurodivergent, whether you're physically disabled like me, my aspirations are no different than before I got injured. I still want to achieve the same thing. So why does neurodivergency or, or physical disability or sensory disability mean that my aspirations have to change it just makes it harder for me and others to achieve it but it's still that drive is still there to to be successful so i get frustrated when i i, I kind of speak to organizations that just want to put all disabled people regardless of what it is into a one box that basically says well you're disabled so you have to sit on the periphery you can watch but you can't take part mm -hmm. that's why i started my company because i very much want to take part <laughs> yeah 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 and you're doing amazing stuff in that in that field i think as well so thank you well credit to you um well i'll go on to sarah next so you know again the, the, what challenges from both sides really from sort of employer and employee side yeah so I think one of the biggest barriers initially is the interview process, if I'm honest. That is one of the biggest things that I come up against many, many times, because when you're neurodivergent, whether you're dyspraxic, dyslexic, autistic, ADHD, most of the time, and this is a sweeping generalisation, is they need processing time. And when you're in an interview scenario, that is not conducive to allowing you to have more processing time. So... I've had I've lost track of the amount of conversations where they haven't escalated past the first interview because they didn't aren't they answered a question, but they answered what they thought was being asked rather than actually that some of the questions can be a bit ambiguous. The quest the language isn't clear enough. And what the neurodivergent candidate will say is actually they are entitled to ask for the questions in advance so they can kind of even if it's only 10 or 15 minutes, but it gives them a chance to process what is actually being asked. However, many of them don't ask for it because they don't want to be perceived as cheating mm. and getting, and actually the amount of conversations that I have is like, it's not cheating. This is about leveling the playing field for you. It's not about giving you an advantage and for them to understand that, but also for employers, I had a client a few weeks ago who was going through an internal process and we talked about the reasonable adjustments that she was entitled to, to ask for in that interview process. Three weeks in advance, she requested those um, adjustments. They came back to her 24 hours before the interview to say, yes, you can have it. By that point, mm -hmm. she is autistic. It was too late. She couldn't. She was in such a state of stress and panic. She just couldn't think straight. So she withdrew. And there's a lot of those things that you will find happening within organisations because of a lack of maybe awareness. I don't know, a lack of understanding from like I find that and I don't know if Dan and James will agree with this, but people use the reasonable adjustments as a tick box. Well, I asked them what they wanted mm. and it's like, mm, yeah, but you haven't followed through and you haven't taken into account what stress you're putting that person under while you're waiting for somebody to approve a reasonable adjustment it's it's really hard but i would say the interview process is one of the most challenged biggest obstacles we know that in statistics i only know mainly from autistic autistic uh, the autistic society only 16 percent, i think of autistic people are in employment yeah that's terrible a lot of them it's not full time and most people will identify that working at a level below what they yeah. believe their own capabilities to be which is yeah. That's Somebody's put, put an interesting comment in the in the chat actually about um, a lot of employers will take on people on the with neurodivergent conditions as volunteers, but don't want to 
pay them so it's not the person per se it's just they don't perceive them to be of, of, of enough value to pay them and it's interesting with the interview process that kind of presupposes that somebody will feel comfortable disclosing yeah. that they have this condition before the interview and a lot of people don't because they expect to be discriminated against i suppose I think that the lived experience of individuals, uh, a lot of the work I do when I talk to employers that have recruited somebody that has a disability or is, is neurodivergent and they haven't disclosed it and then it comes out later down the line, the, the organisation say, well, we, we didn't know and, and we could have done something if we knew. But I think what people fail to understand is that a lot of people have had so many negative experiences when they have disclosed that you automatically put these these barriers up that you think, well, I don't want to be seen as as a lesser person because I'm I'm disclosing. And just the, the point that, that Sarah was make, making around reasonable adjustments, I think there's not enough understanding around the Equality Act and employment around disability. Because one of the duties that's in there is, in, is what's called an anticipatory duty. So you, as an organisation, you have to anticipate that anybody from any one of the protected characteristics would either want to come and use your services or apply for a job within within the business that you have. And it's not about kind of knowing every single aspect of every single disability, because if you had a building the size of Wembley Stadium full of reasonable adjustments, you still wouldn't have enough because it's very different to each individual's need. But just starting the process of thinking, yes, OK, if you're doing a drive to recruit more women into a particular field, how do you know that that woman isn't going to turn up in a wheelchair or it's going to turn up neurodivergent? And it's that intersectionality that we lose because it's OK saying we're going to have a drive to get more women into um, engineering. But that's great. But what happens if that woman turns up and he's in a wheelchair or he's neurodivergent? You need to be able to plan what you're doing around inclusion. And I think for me, again, the point that Sarah's making, it's equity that we lack because it's not cheating. It's leveling the playing field. It's getting you to take a different path to get you to the same point as somebody that isn't neurodivergent or isn't disabled. We talk about equality so much that we lose sight that if we don't have equity, we will never have equality. The, yeah. the one can't happen without the other. We're going to have a whole discussion around that distinction further on the series. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to have you back again, Dan. <laughs> Ileana, sorry, you, we haven't asked, asked you for your thoughts yet. Oh, um, the equity and equality thing is an amazing conversation, and I think it's actually where we've gotten gone really wrong, thinking that equality was the fix. Um, it is actually this year's International Women's Day. Uh, theme, and I'm doing a, quite a big event for it um, with which, um, because, but it, it's not just something that applies to women, it also absolutely applies to any of the other sorts of diversities, especially with disabilities in general. Um, going on to what sort of difficulties do neurodivergent people face, I, I think you're absolutely right, the interview process isn't great. Um, I've seen a couple of things where I wish I had never um, declared at my employment. I will admit I didn't declare until well after I was employed um, because I wasn't comfortable with it yet. I've only recently been very outspoken. And funny enough, that's actually created a much nicer workplace for those who work with me and under me because where I'm openly sharing. So I think employers can do that a little bit better if there is someone who's there or, or you have people in and you can actually show that you're actively listening and treat that person as an individual. And I, I think that's something that we're going to keep getting through all of the questions is that one of the problems is right now facing a job, if I were to put ADHD and I have it on my LinkedIn, so any employer, if I went to change jobs would see it. There is a stigma rightly or wrongly that is in place with any of the neurodivergence, even if it's dyslexia, if it's, and, and I will say, I feel like I'm quite lucky that ADHD is my label and not say autism and that's not a great viewpoint it's a very honest viewpoint but that there are stigmas attached to them that make it easier for me to get an interview and that's not okay so i think it's checking those at the door and the fact that it is very much this stigma that you get if you say I have X and I think we've said there's this scale everybody needs something different what works for one person doesn't and you immediately stop getting treated like a human but as the character like the caricature I should say of your diagnosis when you're trying to get that help you also mentioned about what difficulties do neurodivergent people face in the workplace 
And it's simply that the workplace doesn't think about them. Um, and that they're not meant for people who don't function in X way. I think um, James pointed out, we're all quite different. It doesn't matter if you're neurodivergent or not, each individual is still very much an individual, but corporations and even governments in line with trying to make it helpful, like talking about that, making it a tick box exercise of, of with, it is true because you're trying to be like, okay, we can fix this problem. We fix it by doing one, two, three, and that's it. That people tend to forget that there's a much larger thing. One of the things that I absolutely always talk about is that our current meeting culture is probably one of the worst things for any neurodivergent, whether it's dyslexia because of the number of slides that are used, whether it's ADHD for the amount of time that you tend to sit in these meetings, um, and they tend to also be booked back to back. So both ADHD and autism, we don't have time to go process. So by the time I've moved on to the next meeting, I will have completely forgotten what we talked about. And then you're going, well, why didn't you do that? We discussed it. I'm like, yeah, because I went directly into another meeting and my brain went, I need to focus on this and completely dumped everything that was there. So I think it's a very, we try our best and that's not a bad thing. And at least people are talking about it. But I think current work culture is very anti neurodiverse, but it's also very made into a box of this is our perfect worker and this is how it will be done. And we can have these meetings and these stand-ups in tech. It is a huge problem for those who are neurodivergent. Um, and I particularly find that it's a field that I don't want to say praise because prey means that it's a negative thing, but there are quite a few people in neurodivergence across the board, including autism, especially with some of um, in tech, especially in engineering roles, um, because of incredibly how smart they are. But then you want them for their talent and how incredibly good they are, and then refuse to think that you might need to change some of your other day-to-day -day practices that aren't necessarily one of those tick boxes that, in general, also help everybody else. P.S. Having 15 minutes between your meetings doesn't just help me. It helps all the staff because they don't feel rushed. They don't. So I, I, I think there is a question that is coming, but it is the sometimes you forget that just treating an individual as an individual. It's not that I'm asking for something that will only benefit me. Most of the time, what I'm asking for is going to benefit the entire staff. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good point, actually. I think there's a couple of things as well. I just pick up on the themes. Almost. I think there can be a tendency. Um, I think this has come across that somehow you're going to fix the person rather than maybe looking at your organization, which, um, you know, as you just said, Ileana, you know, a lot of the things that would help somebody with a neurodivergent condition are going to actually help everybody. Um, I think the other thing is in, around sort of um, communication and colleagues and things is how much somebody wants to disclose to the people they work with. And clearly, if somebody, if the stigma is gone or is going, they're going to be more open to discussing their situation and their their requirements and their needs and their differences and that's going to make it easier for everybody as well so it's a sort of win-win if we can break down some of these stigmas and get these conversations going a little bit like in the mental health field um then it helps everybody i think mm -hmm. there's some really interesting stuff going on in the chat i haven't got time to keep up with it all i'm afraid but um, do take a look at the chat box as well if you get a moment um, i'm not the experience actually... on that Sorry, recording. It's a lot of lived experience. There is, there. yeah. I will try and capture that. I think at the end, um, I'm actually I'm very conscious of time because it's five past one, and I do want to give chance for everybody else to contribute. So I'm going to kind of combine what are going to be the next two questions, which is really around the fact that obviously businesses are facing all sorts of huge challenges at the moment, and just to think about you know why they should invest time and resources into employing neurodiverse people. And it kind of links with that really and, and kind of what can they do? What can employers do to help neurodivergent people thrive at work, not just struggle on, but actually, you know, contribute their best, do their best work and feel truly included and part of the, the workplace culture. Um, I'll start with you, Dan, because you haven't started yet. You can go first on this one. <laughs> I think for me, when we look at kind of businesses and industries and particular sectors, we are we are struggling. So I know that the construction industry is one is we've got a very aging um, construction workforce 
and we're not getting people coming into the industry. I know the same with hospitality. We're really struggling to get people to work in these fields. And I think one of the issues that, that businesses have is that they, when they're looking to recruit, that the, the pool of talent that they're looking at, it's effectively they're swimming in the shallow end because it, it's nice and safe. It, it's people that that look like them, that act like them, that, that have the, the, the characteristics that, that they have. And I think what we try and do as a business is try and get organisations to swim a little bit further out into a bit, a bit deeper water because there's this massive pool of talent out there that is just waiting to be given an opportunity. And I think one of the reasons why we are, why businesses need to invest in that is because we are hitting a critical mass in some sectors where we need people in these roles. We need good people to, to take on these roles. And there's millions of disabled people, whether it be neurodivergent, physically disabled, whatever it may be, that would be perfect for these jobs, but they're just not given the opportunity. So I think for me, businesses need to be more aware of and more understanding around the range of neurodiversity that's out there. Um, understanding, again, going back to that intersectionality, that somebody may have one condition that overlaps with something else, but also trying to drop the, the, the stigma and the unconscious bias that they have around the whole topic of neurodiversity. So I think breaking down those barriers and challenging themselves to look at what their processes are, are they truly inclusive? Are they truly accessible to everybody? And to not be afraid to go, we don't know. I think that, that's one of the things that I often say to a lot of businesses. There's no shame in admitting you don't know something when there's organisations and, and people that are on the panel today where our whole working lives is about supporting employers to be more inclusive, to give equity of opportunity to the communities that we represent and we, we support. And I think that's the, the big thing that, that what, what organisations would get if they were to open their doors and um, make their processes more inclusive. They'd get a whole raft of talent with lived experience, with amazing skill sets, with just looking at, at the, the way that, the employment gap around disability and those without disabilities and, and the, the amount of neurodivergent individuals in work, a lot of these people would have been pretty much forced out of organisations for, for want of a strong term, but they would have the experience, they would have the knowledge, they would have had the, the education, and it's just waiting to be tapped into by, the, by any other organisation out there. And I think it's absolutely essential that we start broadening our horizons around what we do with recruitment to get the very best talent into organizations it should be a no-brainer because at the end of the day why would you not want to employ somebody with a disability if they match or, or neurodivergent if they match the criteria and they have the experience and they have the skill set there are plenty of organizations like mine and the organization sarah works for and james that we can do the rest i often say you focus on the talent and i'll do the rest because at the end of the day if the person has a skill set for me talent is talent regardless of how it's packaged talent yeah. is talent so if we start focusing on the person and focusing on the talent then we start to change the way that it works unfortunately it's getting that message out there to businesses we have a skill shortage in so many sectors that so many individuals could easily feel that but this stigma and this the myths and misconceptions around neurodiversity and everything else are preventing businesses from paddling out to that little bit of deeper water because they see it as a risk and it's not and I think that's the, the thing. It, it's a case of, it shouldn't be a case of why should businesses invest? It should be, well, why shouldn't they? Mm. And I think that that for me is the, the big thing. I've never heard a reason from one employer yet that stands up to any sort of scrutiny as to why they can't employ somebody with disability of any form. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ileana, have you got any thoughts on this? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask everybody to keep it brief, actually, because I do want to give um, the audience a chance to... to chip in if they want to i do because i kind of touched base in this in the last part of my last answer but i a because so it's the why should they take time to invest and and resources into employing because it doesn't really take any more resources or time than hiring anybody else which is one of my big bug bears it is actually not this big process it's not this overwhelming thing it's not going to cost your company you know ten thousand pounds more to do something as basic as hiring someone. Yes, there are things that have to be taken into consideration. And some of those can have a cost. Some of the best software from a security standpoint for dyslexia is a bit more expensive some, than some of the open source, but there's a balance and it's still not that much. So I think it's the, and you also wouldn't tell me that you wouldn't, um, James, 
I feel really bad because I can't remember who mentioned names at the beginning of this, but I think it was James. <laughs> of you're talking about, well, why should they hire? Because you wouldn't tell me that you wouldn't hire Henry Ford, Steve Jobs. They are brilliant minds that are all and have proven some sort of new neurodivergence. I mean, in theory, there is a very strong argument, not proven, that Albert Einstein had dyslexia. So please tell me why you wouldn't hire those when they are considered some of the greatest minds of our generation. And it is one of my biggest, I think things that makes me sad in this is how many of those great minds have been shut down to the point that we never know what they could have done for the very basics. So for me, it's a, I absolutely echo the, well, why not? It shouldn't be, why should you? It's, well, why not? It, it makes sense to me, especially with the shortages. Um, we have the same in the cyber skills gap and we're, we're an industry that, the, that, that in general can really accommodate people, especially on the autism scale. Um, and then it's the uh, practical steps. I, I think I talked about this in meetings. I think A, have a talk with them be open, let them communicate. It, it, it doesn't take a lot other than treating someone like a human being and having a human approach to it. It's not gonna be a one size fits all. It is very much a talk with them. I'm very honest, my whole staff knows my spoons and on occasion, yesterday being bad, I was like, I'm just having a bad brain day. Funny enough, it, it's a really bad term, but they all knew that I wasn't gonna be nearly as concentrated. So that probably pop it over in an email because I won't get to it till today. It's just not gonna process, I'm not gonna be able to do it. But you start having those really honest conversations. It's not that I failed at work. I still did a full days of work. I just knew some things were gonna get dropped and I need to pick them up. And it's those small things that go a long way and it's having open communication. And that is probably, the biggest practical step that anybody can have and making sure that you're comfortable having it. I still don't have all the answers when I'm managing my, the, the people under me who are neurodiver neurodivergent. And I, I have, you know, I've been very honest, spoken about it several times. I'm ADHD. In theory, I should have all the answers. I don't. And I think sometimes just going, I'm not sure how I can support you. I can read on this, but what can I do, especially right now, to support you and however you're feeling goes a lot longer than going, well, I read this book and this is the tick box that I need to do. And this is how we're going to fix this. It's just not going to work. No, good point. It's funny, whatever, whatever the topic on these panels, it often comes back to communication. At some point, we're always talking about you've just got to talk to people. You've just got to talk to people really, really briefly, Sarah, if you've got anything to add. Um, just the reasonable adjustments, workplace adjustments don't have to be difficult. I think it doesn't have to go in the too hard box echoing what other people said it's about communication opening up and at the end of the day why wouldn't you want to invest in the people that work for you I don't like you get out what you put in mm -hmm. and when whether you're neurodivergent disabled physically disabled or just neurotypical if you work for an organization that you know is supportive and willing to invest in you and make you feel important you get loyalty back yeah absolutely it's, it's again, it's, it's, it comes back to treating people as people, isn't it? And it's mm -hmm. if you do these things to help one person, it probably suggests you're a good employee who will do those things to help everybody. Finally, James, if you can just add your. Wow, add your try. <laughs> um, yeah, I think one thing which worries about me about these big organisations coming up with DE and I strategies is it's it's not a verb. It's not just a thing you do. It's a competence. And if you do diversity without having the skills and the capabilities in place, it will fail. And what really worries me is we're going through a bit of a trend at the moment of companies going like, oh, yeah, amazing. Let's hire all these people. But actually, they've not really put the competencies in place. I think it has to be a cultural thing. Now, we've done a few talks and people have come up to us and asked the question, what do we do if we put a reasonable adjustment in place for somebody and a colleague starts resenting the fact that we've done that? And so you've got to look at it two ways. One, that's not a very nice person, but let's give them the benefit doubt. Or maybe they're struggling too, and maybe they need some help. They just appear to be coping. So my view is if you want to be good at hiring people of all sorts of disabilities, make your culture about reasonable adjustments, whether there's a disability or not. Create an adjustable environment which allows people to live to their strengths, you know, that you support them through their weaknesses, you figure out what people's preferences are and organize the cognitive diversity in your team 
in order to create an environment where you actually do a lot better. And in terms of the challenges businesses are having, what you need to do is you need that critical mindset that reasonable adjustments demand of you, that ability to say, like, what we're doing is not good enough and we need to do better. If you take that mindset, that will help you solve problems really, really well. And then if you have people who think differently and experience the world differently to you, synergistically you'll achieve great things. And that one thing I'm a bit worried about is that we need to be careful not to keep competing, you know, identifying autism and ADHD with these super talented people because they're not all super not everyone's that level of talent and that can be quite harmful you know the people we work with on the not-for-profit side of our business might have extremely extreme difficulties around learning and processing and things like that and they sort of fit into an area of average capability you know and they compete in that market but they've got a severe sensory issue or they've got issues around communication and employers are just not willing to do that because there's plenty of people of their capability around. They're just just not necessarily able to do that. So I think it's important to say, like, actually, you can be really, really capable, but let's not try and get too far into the whole superpower narrative. We don't want superhumans. You don't want people to be identified. Why should there be a payoff? Actually, I think what we all want to be treated is is as humans and as individuals. Yeah. Um, so I think that's quite important, but um, yeah, I'll stop there. So briefly, back, back, <laughs> Eliana, you, you, you've got something you want to add? I was just about to say, and it kind of goes, because I use some of the very popular ones who did amazing, great things. It's also as good as your company wants to be. There are sometimes just jobs that will not fit the applicant. It doesn't matter if I'm neurodiverse or not. I have roles in my organization that are incredibly um, customer facing, as in you have to deal with people literally all day, every day and talk to them. It's expected of you. That's never going to be accommodated to a point with someone who is extremely uncomfortable is ever going to thrive. And I think sometimes instead of it, it and it's not it's coming back to the point of don't make it a tick box. I'm not hiring this person. It's I'm hiring a person because they're a great fit and they're going to add to the organization instead of setting them up for failure. Someone was talking about that earlier. If it doesn't matter how many adjustments, you're just going to fail harder. And it, and as someone who's neurodiverse, the more that you do and the more I'm still not able to get it, the worse I feel. If you've made accommodations and I've had to ask for something, and I very rarely do, it is really uncomfortable for me from past trauma um, of if you put in three or four different accommodations and I get to the end and I still can't can't do it, I'm going to feel much worse than if we just went at the beginning, hey, maybe not something you should be working on. I get that it's not. Here's something that suits your strengths. We can get this done by someone else because you're not creating an inclusive environment that's actually going to benefit anybody at the end of the day by trying too much, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And I mean, that, that again, it's one of these things. It doesn't only apply to neurodivergent individuals. Whatever your cognitive sort of preferences or whatever, there are going to be some things that you find are naturally easy, you're naturally good at, and some things that you don't. And playing to people's strengths, whatever their abilities or disabilities might be, is, is often the best way to go in business. Because if people are doing stuff that they're good at and they love and they enjoy, then they're going to be more engaged. So I think that's across the board. It's another one of these things where we're, we're talking about people and people are people. And, and, and I think that's true for everybody. I'll go back to you, Dan. Yeah, it's just a, a couple of quick points, really. I think, first of all, when we talk about reasonable adjustments, it, it kind of, I think one of the issues organisations have is we have a piece of legislation called the Equality Act. So when we talk about equality, it means kind of the same. Everyone gets treated the same. Mm. And then we have the reasonable adjustment side of, of the act. And I've spoken to organisations and I've had comments when I've been talking about reasonable adjustments and they go, oh, no, we can't do that. Because if we do that for that person, we have to do that for everybody because they, they focus on the equality part of, of the act. So I think what we really need to do is a bigger driver around equity, around that it's not about giving an advantage to somebody. It's about literally levelling the playing field. 
It's about saying what we do different for that individual means they have the same opportunity to perform as somebody that doesn't have a neurodivergent condition or a, or a disability. And just going back to the other point as well, going back to the point that, that James made around not focusing on, on those kind of superhumans, as, as James put it, in terms of the, the autistic world. One of my biggest bugbears when London hosted the Olympics, and I, I worked on the Olympic project as a, on, for the ODA and, and LOCOG, when the Paralympics come about, all the posters advertising it all said superhuman. Not a good reference, but you had a picture of Oscar Pistorius, superhuman. I don't look good in Lycra. Never have, never will. I'm <laughs> never going to compete in the Olympics. But that doesn't make, doesn't make me less superhuman in my own right for what I do do. I think everybody that, and I, I don't care who you are, everybody faces challenges and, and barriers. And if you're going through a bad time, if you get out of bed every day, you front up, you show up, you put a shift in and you live your life, you're superhuman. I think everybody is in their own way. The reason I think we have to have these role models is because we set the bar so low for disability and neurodivergence in terms of what people are capable of. So absolutely, there is a spectrum where some people will never achieve what the likes of Steve Jobs or Alan Turing did. But it's about saying, actually, you can't set the bar so low because look what happens when we have individuals that can go on and do that. Look at the way the world can change. And I think for me, what we need to do is raise the level of expectation, is actually say, let's give people the opportunity to be all they can be. Now, if that is just the case of you can only work four hours a day in a supermarket and that's all you can be, let's be proud of that. Let's go, well, actually, that person is still doing that. That's their level. But somebody else may be able to go on and, and replicate what Steve Jobs did. I think it's about creating that understanding that we have to be able to say this person has gone on and done this. It, and, and I hate the term of it, but in spite of all of these other barriers that they face. They've gone on and, and done that. And I think a lot of my lived experience where I've been held back in my career hasn't been because I'm not capable. It's because the expectation level of what I can offer has been drastically diminished from the day I got blown up. And I think that's what we need to change. We need to start getting organisations to see what people can achieve and give them a, an opportunity to do that in an equitable way and stop, keep going on about, uh, we need it to be equal and we need equality. No, we need equity. Equality is this beautiful, euphoric destination we want to get to. But unless we have a vehicle called equity, we're never going to make that journey. And I think for me, that's the, the real issue that, that needs tackling. Yeah, well, as I say, we, we're coming back. We've got a whole panel. I can't remember. I'll come back to that. We've got a whole about equality and equity. That's that's one of the titles that we've got in there. Um, right, we haven't got much time left, and I'm conscious that there are a lot of you here, but if anybody has got anything they'd like to ask or add, then if you can raise your hand, and it'd be really nice if you are going to speak, if you put, pop your camera on if you don't mind, but it's not essential. Stunned silence. Oh, I've got a question. Go ahead then, Joe. Um, so thinking back to what you guys was a really interesting conversation, thinking about what you guys were talking about, you know, about the labeling and this whole challenge around labeling. How do you strike the balance between people getting, I will use the term label, getting labeled so that they can get the right help medically and socially versus that label then being having the opposite effect of what you want it to have, have effect, which is coming to what Max James said very at the beginning is, we're all neurodiverse because we're all different and we're all somewhere on the, you know, where's normal on the spectrum. So how do you balance people getting a diagnosis like Liana was talking about and then not that then getting, do you see what I'm trying to say, and getting in the way of being accepted for whoever you are? Absolutely. Who wants to dive in on that one then? I wouldn't mind if I start, if I sorry. Well, I was just going to say, because um, I went through this with my sons. I got a lot of criticism from people when I was going down the diagnosis route. Friends and family saying, oh, but you're just going to get them labelled. And for me, it was never about the label. It was about helping them to understand themselves so that they can advocate for themselves. And we did it in particular. It took me six years to get my eldest son diagnosed. It was a real battle because nobody could see it. Um, because he masks so incredibly well that actually when they're in school you're relying very much on the school's experience and he was fine at school academically bright 
it was actually what we were experiencing at home that was the challenge because that's his safe space mm. but equally having that diagnosis in place it opened up the world so he can now advocate for himself when he finds things a bit much they understand at school that he can kind of he's got his safe place that he can go but they created that now without that diagnosis or that perceived label nobody would necessarily take him seriously and actually he's thriving at secondary school and it could have been an utter disaster yeah that's, that's really interesting um Ileana and Dan and I think you both were trying to speak as well. Do you want to go next, Diana? Um, this is a very personal one for me because I don't particularly like labels. But when I went to get my diagnosis, it had nothing to do with giving myself a label. And I hope one day we can. It's the whole reason my women's group is called Witch. It's about reclaiming the power in something. And, and there is power behind it. But the power isn't for me to go to employer going, I have ADHD. It's actually being able to recognize what I've been feeling personally for my entire life is suddenly not something I've been called lazy. Nope. My brain just physically, I can look at that hanger, walk by it. Every time I walk by it, go, I need to pick it up, stand there, stare at it, end up in tears because physically my brain just won't pick it up. It's literally the same of um, I, I, it, there's an amazing analogy, especially for ADHD is, um, it's the same block that if I turned on the stove top for you guys, that you would see a hot plate and your brain goes, nope, we're not going to do that. That will hurt. That's the same type of block that I have when I see certain tasks. It's not always a hanger. I like using the hanger because it's definitely a common one for me. So for me, it wasn't about getting that label and Honestly, it takes some self-owning. It's very much about understanding how my brain functions for me and what I can do. And then if someone calls me lazy, I can go, yeah, what you're saying means nothing. I literally have three jobs. There's nothing lazy about that. But it's understanding that the running and my jobs are my strength. My cleanliness isn't. And the cleanliness isn't necessarily my worth. So it has nothing to do with public perception. It's actually how I'm able to process and understand where my past trauma and there are we talked about a lot of things but there's a lot of things that are comorbid with these such as depression and anxiety because of things like masking so it has nothing to do with it's my ability to understand and root out and make myself the best version of me that means still going to be different but that label and that diagnosis makes such a difference for me not anybody else sorry i could go on for that one it's a, it's a touchy one <laughs> um do you have something pressing to say down i'd just like helen to have a chance to because she's waiting patient with her hand literally up. just just two seconds really Brilliant. i think that the, the thing with labels I, I i don't me personally i don't have an issue with being called disabled or the, or the word disability i think that it's very much down to the individual in terms of how they feel about it we there, there, there's i've got a really good friend of mine who's disabled who wants to do away with the word disability and i don't because for me, I use my disability as a show of my strength, a show of my resilience to overcome what happened to me, to go on and build a life and build a career and build a company. So I think it's got to be very much, again, we've, we've talked about things being person-centered and how you choose to use the, the label so much in terms for your own individual needs should be down to the individual. I think what happens, we get so wrapped up in the labels and the cosmetic around the labels, we lose sight of the real issues that impact people's daily lives. So just very quickly give an example, the changing from what was called a disabled toilet to an accessible toilet. Me as a disabled person, I couldn't give a toss what you call it. What I care about is does every publicly accessed building have a toilet facility that's safe for me to use? The answer is no. Now, what would have been a really big win for the disabled community was making sure that that facility was available. But what we did, we had a big parade and went, oh, we've changed it from disabled to accessible. That doesn't help me go to the toilet when I'm breaking my neck out in public, coming out of a meeting, and I can't find somewhere to go to the toilet. Because what we did, we dealt with a cosmetic issue that really bears no relevance on the practicalities of what it is to live with a disability. So I think what we, what we tend to do is we do these things because it puts other people at ease rather than help the actual community that it's supposed to. 
So for me, lab- the, the whole thing of, of labelling is a personal choice. I've got no issue with being called disabled or, or saying I have a disability because it goes to show actually everything I do is in spite of the fact I got blown up. Everything I do is in spite of the fact I've got no legs and I'm in a wheelchair. So for me, my disability is a show of the strength and the determination of if you work with me, look what I've achieved in spite of my disability. So imagine what I can achieve for you. And that's how I use it. Brilliant. Helen, um, if anybody has to leave, I appreciate we're running over here. So do do sort of dip out if you need to. But H- Helen, can I just come to you? Because you've been very patient. <laughs> Sorry, Helen. <laughs> no, 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 it's absolutely fine. Not a problem. Um, I think the interesting thing is for me um, is is looking at kind of almost one step on from the discussions that we've been having. I've never had a problem getting a job um, in the same way that as another sort of similar analogy, my <laughs> you'll love me to say that my partner's never had a problem getting a girlfriend. <laughs> I'd like to hope he doesn't have any more. I'm, I'm just quite happy with the one he's got. <laughs> Let's stop way, now. Yeah. <laughs> you've done enough now. In the same way that my son never had a problem making friends or getting into situations at school, what's been the heartache for all of us is that when you're in that situation and you've been welcomed in, is then how you're treated by the pack. So it's the people around you, because often you're recruited by people who are then not your managers or your you know you're around the kids not the teachers um the heartbreak for me is when something happens and it always does i I hate to say it but every single job i have ever had i have either been fired from or bullied out of and i'm 54 nearly so it's a lot of jobs for me it's i expect people to behave like people i learned very early on that the vast majority of people are pretty vile and i don't want anything to do with them i don't spend a lot of time with people i don't have any friends I don't have a bigger family. I just don't go out a lot because I've learned the hard way that that's not the best thing to do. The heartbreak for me has always been when I've gone to somebody for help, whether that's my son going to a teacher, whether it's my partner going back to his parents in in the past or me going to somebody that I thought I could trust in the workplace to say, help me. This is happening. Help me. My partner used to have it's your fault. If you don't change and be normal, you're never going to be loved. My son was told by one of my old teachers who I thought, at least I could punch you now because I'm older and I'm his mum, that he asks for it. You know, to be told that a nine year old asks for being beaten up. And for me, I continue to be told if you can't be normal, this is going to be the way it is. If you can't sit and talk about the things that we're interested in, if you can't stop talking about the things that you're interested in, If you can't shut up, if you can't talk more often, if you can't sit down, if you can't stand up, if you can't. For me, I go back to a traumatic childhood in which I talk about this Goldilocks moment that whatever I was, it was either not enough or too much. It was never perfect. And unless I could achieve that Goldilocks point, I was never going to be loved by my mother. My partner was never going to have a a girlfriend that loved him. My son was never going to fit in at school. And I'm never going to be able to get a job. And I know that now I've given up. I've literally been pushed to the point where my business isn't quite working yet. It's early days. And I've been looking at jobs recently online and I have cried and cried just looking through the job listings on Indeed, because for me, I can already preempt what's going to happen. It may never do, but I can always already preempt it because why would it be any different? Because that's the way it's always been. I've thought of getting through an interview and trying to be normal. The idea of trying to be normal. I can probably hold it on for a couple of weeks. I can be normal for a couple of weeks, but I can't do it much longer than that. And then when I'm finally me, that's when it starts. The bullying starts. And then it's that point of going to somebody and going, I'm really unhappy. I'm see, I don't want to be spoken to like that. What's your choice? Be normal or leave. I'm self-employed now. And like I said earlier, I know um, one of you mentioned that um, the 16 percent of people in, in employment who are neurodiverse, there's a heck of a lot more in self-employment because a lot of mm. us have come to that conclusion that this is the only way I, I did. Sadly, the only way I was ever going to find a workplace I belonged in was to create it myself. Um, and I work on my own by myself. I don't leave the house that often because, you know, don't like noisy places, but it's on my terms. Um, and that's the heartbreak. It's as I say, as a child who grew up in an abusive situation, 
it in some ways the abuse wasn't the worst thing it was the not being believed and not being helped that was so much worse and it's been the same with neurodiversity you know invite me through the door and then where am I going to go it just back out again and that that's the sad bit that's I mean that's very powerful hearing that from you yeah thanks Helen thanks for sharing that um I think when you listen to stories like Helen the real powerful thing is not so much the toxic word isn't the word autism or disability or anything like that the toxic word is normal mm -hmm. I think yeah. the sooner we eliminate the concept that people there's a normal type of person like I and like we all strive to be normal that's yeah, you know like, the, 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 this is the perfect kind of thing to yeah. be yeah. yeah, and we all find little environments where we where we thrive, where we do really well. It might be in a particular sport we enjoy doing or pastime. Like I used to spend a lot of time hanging out in the games workshop playing Warhammer as a teenager. Girls were terrifying until the age of about 18. And, you know, I felt like myself then. I was around with people who were like me. You know, that's what, I was, that's what worked. And so in that environment, that was we were our normal. We were geeky kids who played little miniatures and played games with each other and, and so on. We like strategy and stuff like that. You know, yeah. it's it's yeah, we if we just need to get rid of this concept of of normal and then adjust. And I think one important thing, we've used the word reasonable adjustment. If we break that word down or those two words down, you've got reasonable, not unreasonable, and adjustment is something you do to improve your capability. Like, why don't we just do this? If we if we face this, then we could do amazing things. Um, but it's this driving towards normal that's causing us the harm. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to call time. I'm gonna, I really don't want to. Got last word. <laughs> Sorry. Um, unless there's something Edward, somebody just absolutely can't not say. Um, I think we're gonna have to have to shut it down. I will try and capture some of the stuff in the chat box because there's been some amazing stuff in Sometimes. there. I will send out an email that, that the whole session's been recorded, and will probably try and add some resources and things and sources of information um, into that email thanks so much for everybody for coming and thank you to my amazing panel I think we could have just carried on well all day I reckon on this one <laughs> we're going to have to revisit I think with something um, further down the line the next session is on the 23rd of March we're actually looking at skills and recruiting developing and retaining skills which kind of does still they all relate together because these things are all about about people and the workplace so thanks thanks very much for everybody um and hope you've enjoyed it and got something from it